Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gennady Stolyarov II. I am the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party, the chief executive of the Nevada Transhumanist Party, and author of Death is Wrong, the illustrated children's book on indefinite life extension. And with me today, I am honored to have Bobby Ridge, a researcher into transhumanism, as well as the forthcoming secretary treasurer of the United States and Nevada Transhumanist Party. So welcome, Bobby. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so uh, tell us a bit more about your research into transhumanism. What are you working on right now? Uh, actually, is in congruence with how I discovered transhumanism. Um, I just started doing research um, on um, the scientific method and how much science impacts society. Uh, and it only took me a few months after that uh, to discover transhumanism. Uh, and so I, just, I started doing research on December 25th, 2016. So it's like really preliminary right now. And I kind of think of myself in like the philosophical stage uh, for many reasons. Uh, because science tends to take a while, um, first off. And then second, it's hard to think of an experiment for my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And my hypothesis being that the scientific method is the most reliable method that we know of to determine truth. Uh, and, and so a few problems with that hypothesis is how do you think of an experiment to falsify that hypothesis or attempt to falsify it? Um, because that would be circular reasoning, um, or at least it seems like that. Uh, or maybe that further vindicates how um, voracious it is, how vertical it is. No, no. It's, it's a problem um, of logic that uh, I haven't quite figured out yet, and may never figure out. Um, but I, I try not to worry about that too much, because uh, the impact of science seems pretty obvious in the last 400 years. Um, and so it took me probably like two months to discover transhumanism, because I, I was trying to research the frontier mm -hmm. of science and technology, and, uh, and transhumanism is at that forefront. It's not, it's not, it seems like transhumanism is like a collection of all the frontiers. That's kind of, I think, of the definition. Um, at least it's with, encompassed within the definition. It's, uh, it's not a specific discipline, it's uh, very interdisciplinary. Yes. Um, I like, it could even be like the you know, broadest aspect. And it's certainly uh, quite interesting that transhumanism is an intersection of philosophy and science and technology and also their impacts on society and culture. And one of the things you mentioned in regard to the scientific method is the transformative impact that it has had on human lives over the past 400 years. Indeed, uh, perhaps it is not so important to place a definitive justification on the scientific method so much as just to observe its consequences yes. in improving everyday lives of individuals, lengthening life expectancies, creating more material prosperity and more knowledge of the world. Yeah, so that's kind of how I've been trying to describe its impact. Um, not really thinking of an experiment to attempt to falsify it, but just showing how much it's um, a positive impact. And there's only, I think, 8.4 million scientists in America. Um, and 90% of the scientists um, that have existed throughout history are alive right now. Yes. And on top of it, you, know, you see a massive amount of oppression of science and a uh, massive amount of um, illiteracy. And so for it to make such a massive impact with you know those hindrances, I think just it shows how um, much merit it has. And, uh, and that's you know, a huge thing that excites me about it. And that's what led me to transhumanism. And, uh, and it's definitely, the arguments of transhumanism are very convincing uh, about indefinite longevity and um, ASI and, um, and what that's going to lead to in the near future. Yes, indeed. It, it seems to me that transhumanism is an extension of the scientific method and the scientific process. If you take the discoveries that have been arrived at in the past, the technologies that have been achieved, and you extrapolate them into the future, you get a kind of transhumanist world. Of course, different people will have different 
impressions of what that world would look like, but the idea that we're not just stopping here, we're not just stopping at the status quo, this is not the outermost edge of possibility. Uh, would you agree that uh, that's essentially implied by the scientific method and the pursuit of new knowledge? Um, uh, on, um, so you're asking um, how it, the, how the scientific method pushes um, yes. knowledge? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, it's a, I think it's a problem of induction, how uh, there's an infinite uh, of hypotheses and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, I mean, definitely it's, it's, it seems to be pushed in front here. Uh, but I actually take a little bit of a different approach to mm -hmm. the scientific method. Uh, you kind of hear the same um, definition of it, how it's not absolute truth mm -hmm. in, um, and that you still have to be very skeptical of it and there's many different other ways of determining truth. And so my hypothesis was that it's the only reliable method and so if you really uh, apply that to not just determining truth, but as almost a construct of our universe, mm -hmm. um, I've made a few different interesting hypotheses on top of that. Um, for example, uh, I think it, if it's the only way to that we know to determine truth, I applied it to consciousness. Ah. And I kind of think of, I, I thought of my own definition of consciousness with scientific method, which is, mm -hmm an increase of questions and hypotheses uh, that can be conducted by some entity mm -hmm. and the, the ability to conduct experiments and um, find results and propose more hypotheses mm -hmm. um, is its ability to, this entity's ability to become more conscious. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that's kind of part of my paper um, is um, outlining that definition of consciousness. It's, it's interesting because uh, I've had some writings on similar themes, particularly uh, on self-awareness and personal identity and the concept that I formulated of I-ness, which is the vantage point from which one perceives the world, the idea that uh, I experience life, I perceive the world as me and you do the same as you. and it's not really possible for me to get inside your head, inside your vantage point. I could try to, for instance, empathize with what life must be like for you and you can do the same for me. But ultimately our direct personal experience of the world, that's what we should try to preserve in terms of seeking life extension, in terms of seeking better health. It's, that sounds like qualia. Yeah, it's a, essentially it's the qualia of being you, being who yeah. you are. And uh, my paper, uh, from 2010, which uh, anyone can find online, is entitled, uh, How Can I, emphasize, Live Forever? What Does and Does Not Preserve the Self? And it's also a philosophical discussion about, well, if you interrupt conscious awareness in a certain sense, like if you go to sleep, uh, you still wake up the same person. If you go under general anesthesia, you still wake up the same person. But then if somebody took you apart atom by atom and reconstructed you, uh, I don't think you would be the same person. There would be some conscious entity at the other end of that, but it wouldn't have that same inus, that same qualia as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, other um, domains I took the scientific method is, uh, is with morals. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to take it to intelligence and free will and mm -hmm. um, other areas, but that's a little bit more loose right now. Um, but for example, with morals, it seems like um, the scientific method and uh, uncontroversial scientific results are in congruence with morals. Yes. Um, for example, um, vaccinating your kids. Of course. Um, people don't believe in the scientific results, and you see now like 78 cases of measles in like Minnesota. Or, or, um, I forgot which state specifically. Yes, yeah, so and there there have been outbreaks, say, of whooping cough in California and several other states, and uh, you're entirely correct. Uh, if there are facts, scientific facts, that indicate that certain courses of behavior are more or less conducive to human flourishing, then it seems that ignoring those facts deliberately would be a breach of ethics. If yeah. parents refuse to consider the science uh, and refuse to vaccinate their children, they may be endangering their children, they also are endangering other people. Yeah, and there's so many different examples, you know, climate crisis, um, you know, virtually every Republican in Congress doesn't believe in the climate crisis. 
um, and, and the evidence behind it. And I think like one of them says that they agree, but they um, don't um, think it's man-made. They think it's like um, you know, just a natural process. Um, which what are they doing? They are putting our species um, at potential extinction and just a massive amount of destruction. And that kind of like shows you know, an example of science being in congruence with morals. Uh, and it takes you like to really interesting routes of, uh, of it being an arbiter. Mm -hmm. uh, and are politicians allowed to deny scientific, uncontroversial scientific results? Uh, and it seems like they aren't allowed to. And if they do, then they're putting, it, putting us at a large um, risk. And uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned the hindrances to scientific literacy and the role of science in shaping the decisions that are made in public life. Uh, what do you think are some approaches that one might at least consider to uh, help overcome that ignorance or resistance to scientific yeah. knowledge? Yeah, uh, it's pretty tough. I'm not sure if I have the answer. Uh, some people are just like so against science, and it's pretty interesting seeing them, you know, use their iPhone or their laptop. <laughs> they're, they're making arguments against science while they're on their laptop or they're driving their car and using GPS, and um, it just shows you uh, the hypocrisy and where the mind can take somebody, uh, and helping them overcome it. You know, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you'd think that people would have overcame it by now in the 21st century with, with all the palpable evidence in front of us, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it doesn't seem to have happened. Now, it's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of that, let's say, deliberate ignorance or refusal to recognize certain scientific ideas, say the, the theory of evolution, uh, or you mentioned climate change or the efficacy of vaccines, it stems in part from the lack of immediate direct consequences to uh, not recognizing those ideas. So let's say somebody is a young earth creationist, believes that the world started in the year 4004 BC, and they can wake up tomorrow and have a fairly comfortable material life. They can use their iPhones and computers and drive their car to work, and all of their technology will function as well as our technology will function. On the other hand, if someone has a uh, pseudo-scientific theory about uh, being able to levitate in the air without any sort of technological aid and they decide to act on it by walking uh, out the window of a fifth-story building, something really bad is going to happen to them. Yeah. And this is why we don't see a lot of people hold that view. So it seems to me that the indirect nature of the consequences of certain beliefs, certain false beliefs, is what precludes uh, people from recognizing the error. So, in a sense, uh, what do you think might be some ideas to uh, make those consequences more real in the minds of people? Yeah, uh, it definitely shows how fallible the mind is. Uh, you have people not believing in gravity or mm -hmm. you know, flat earth society. Uh, and it's really tough. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, explained it really well. Um, he responded to, I think, Lawrence Krauss mm -hmm. about Lawrence Krauss just thinks that education and science um, mm -hmm. is enough. I think eventually that would occur. I actually am um, um, contemplating a K-12 sort of um, educational system to teach science. And instead of maybe like a senior project, you'd have like, like the senior um, students publishing their paper inside some philosophy journal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, but Neil deGrasse Tyson explained it really well. He said that, uh, I think the last statistic was 7% of the International, or, yeah, international um, Science Academy, uh, they, uh, the National Science Academy, National, the international Science Academy, that's, that's kind of hard to say. Uh, they, they believe in a personal God mm -hmm. and they pray to him um, and the 93% don't. And so he says, how can you expect the public to do better than um, the greatest scientists that exist right now? Or even like Isaac Newton and, and, um, right. and uh, many just like most top tier scientists um, believed in um, 
um, a religious entity and, um, and didn't rely on scientific evidence and so it's, how can you expect you know, the public to do better than like the greatest scientists that ever existed. Mm -hmm. And I think historically, of course, uh, religious belief was extremely prevalent, even among the most educated, cutting-edge thinkers of the day, in part because the theoretical framework for explaining phenomena without uh, the invocation of some divine intervention was absent, say, prior to the theory of evolution, and indeed there, there were various attempts at a theory of evolution even prior to Charles Darwin, say the Lamarckian theory which asserted that uh, individual specimens can acquire traits during their lifetime and pass them on. Well maybe during, uh, during the future with genetic engineering that might be possible, but clearly it's not possible in, in nature right now. Uh, but prior to uh, the 18th century Age of Enlightenment, there wasn't this idea that you could have an emergent order from simpler elements and simpler dynamics. Uh, an order that's not a consequence of somebody's intention, but rather that forms on its own through essentially uh, a set of rules being acted upon and generating something more complex. That's essentially what evolution is. It's also what an economy is. And uh, it's an essential principle by which societies can produce, uh, say, a, a lot more goods and very sophisticated cultural interactions that no individual intended. But prior to the 18th century, uh, that was not contemplated. So a lot of uh, even cutting-edge thinkers uh, would say, well, uh, at some point there needed to be an origin and there needed to be someone to set the laws in motion or to set life in motion. Uh, and that would be uh, somebody extremely powerful, maybe somebody omnipotent, like a god. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, so with religion, um, I think that science, I think most scientists would think that it's a completely polar opposite. And you can definitely make the argument. And I tried making the argument that um, there is some overlap. Mm -hmm. And so, w what I've noticed um, with um, linguistics is that our ability we're only capable of asking questions that are making statements. And a statement can kind of be loosely defined as a hypothesis. And and so that's what religious people do, right? They they have their hypotheses, right? And you know, that the the earth is or even the universe is like seven to ten thousand years old or or that um, humans came from, you know, sand and a rib or or, you know, great Mumbo vomited, you know, the universe. Um, and they all have their hypotheses. And their conjectures, and uh, I think it's it is completely appropriate to believe in these things, uh, maybe even more than what um, the scientific evidence shows. But uh, and it's what I call superlative cognitive dissonance. Uh, it's okay to have this belief even if it contradicts reality, uh, but as long as your behavior doesn't contradict reality. Um, you know, all all those people who don't believe in gravity. Uh, as long as they're not teaching people to like jump off buildings, yes, it's okay to have that belief because it's, science doesn't really know it's it to be purely truth, right? You got the problem with induction or or that logical argument I, I made about how you can't think of an experiment to falsify an experiment, uh, whether an experiment is um, you know purely um, is determines absolute truth because it seems like circular reasoning. Uh, scientists will know that um, science doesn't provide absolute truth. Um, so you could ha see um, why it's appropriate to believe in these um, hypotheses that um, don't have any evidence for them, but as long as your behavior doesn't represent it. Yes. Well, there are some interesting thoughts along these lines. Voltaire did write, uh, essentially, if someone can convince you to believe in absurdities, then they can convince you to commit atrocities. But as you pointed out, that's not always the case. And it's not the case for every individual because there are a variety of other factors, other influences that would hold that individual in check. So most young earth creationists are perfectly respectable people in their day-to-day -day conduct. And I think uh, it's important also to recognize in some respects they can be our allies because 
they do embrace technology to a certain extent. They might not mind the next version of the iPhone. They might not mind the next generation of open heart surgery or yeah. uh, artificial limbs. So the question is, uh, I think in our society where you're going to have a diversity of perspectives, how to get people with these diverse perspectives to align with us on practical goals like continuing the advancement of technology, continuing the advancement of longer lifespans. There are many religious texts that, uh, whether it's accurate or not, posit that at some point there used to be much longer lived humans. And I don't believe that there was actually a Methuselah who lived to be 969 years, but if a young earth creationist uh, who is a biblical literalist believes that, then maybe that could be an argument to get them on our side. Yeah. To say, okay, well, Methuselah could do it, why not us? Yeah, and actually, uh, I conceived of transhumanism um, before I really discovered the demographic, because it just seems so obvious that with the minute amount of scientists and um, that have made such an impact in such a small amount of time, uh, obviously, if imagine 7.5 billion people all on board um, um, complying with science and conducting it even, um, you know, that, that civilization would uh, advance at an insane rate. And you see, uh, it's easy to ponder about indefinite longevity and uh, a super intelligence. And so that's why I was like really excited to discover mm -hmm. transhumanism and how developed it is. Um, yes, indeed. And we hope to develop it further as well. Uh, now, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, thank you for your time today. Yeah. And second, uh, Welcome to the Secretary Treasurer yeah, position of the US excited. Transhumanist Party. Uh, we very much look forward to further discussions and to your involvement in the transhumanist movement. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.